Hello, I'm Darina Landa, and I'm the Executive Director of Advancement at the University of Toronto's Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are truly grateful for the opportunity to work on this land. And I'm so pleased to welcome you today to our latest installment in our Temerty Medicine Talk series on the topic of aerospace medicine. U of T's relationship with aerospace and military medicine dates back over a century. Some may not know that Frederick Banting, famous for discovering insulin 100 years ago at U of T, also helped establish the field of aviation medicine in Canada and built the foundation for advances in Canadian aerospace medicine that continue today. And just recently on Remembrance Day, we unveiled a plaque commemorating the 18 alumni who have served in the Canadian military as Surgeon General over the last hundred years, representing almost half of all those who have served in this role. And now, as you'll hear today, U of T is set to take aviation medicine to new heights. I hope you enjoy today's discussion and I look forward to hosting more Temerty Medicine Talks in the new year. I'd now like to turn it over to Dr. Patricia Houston, Vice Dean of Medical Education, and currently the Acting Dean for the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Thank you, Darina. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you all to this Temerty Medicine Talk. This series was established as our way of sharing some of the remarkable work underway in our faculty and with our partner hospitals, and more importantly, the impact of this work. We are a research and education hub within Toronto's robust health sciences network, and the Temerty Faculty of Medicine is uniquely positioned to advance health and health care for our patients, families, and their communities. During these talks, you'll hear directly from leading U of T researchers, clinicians, and educators who are tackling medicine's big questions and working to develop innovative solutions. Today, Dr. Joan Sayre will be speaking about our rich history in aerospace medicine and some of our plans to propel U of T in Canada into the future of this field. I'm very pleased to be welcoming back Andre Picard, the award-winning health columnist for the Globe and Mail, who will guide our conversation. Thank you, Andre, for being with us again today. And now I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce today's topic and presenter. Hello, I'm Andre Picard. I'm the health columnist at the Globe and Mail, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. Uh, humanity has long been fascinated by the heavens, the stars, human flight, and now space travel. Today, we have the International Space Station, space tourism, talk of colonizing Mars, and of course, an endless series of Star Trek movies. In reality and in science fiction, medicine plays a key role in traveling the universe. How will weightlessness affect our bodies? Will isolation and emptiness of space make us crazy? Will there be new pathogens in these new environments? What happens if we get sick 2 million miles from a hospital? Aerospace medicine is an exciting field and it has many applications on Earth, especially as climate change creates more extreme environmental conditions on Earth. To help us understand those issues and many more, we have a terrific guest today. Uh, Dr. Joan Seri is an occupational medicine specialist and an, ex an expert in extreme environments. In addition to working at St. Michael's Hospital, she oversees the aerospace medicine education initiatives at the Temerty Faculty of Medicine and serves as the chair of aerospace medicine at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Seri is a consultant to the Canadian Armed Forces and the Canadian Space Agency, where she participates in the development of medical standards for the International Space Station. She was recently named one the top 25 women in defense by Esprit de Corps magazine. So don't mess with her. Now her full bio is in the chat, but we want to spend our time listening to her. Uh, Dr. Seri is going to give a brief presentation, then I'll ask her some questions, including many uh, great audience questions we've received. So Dr. Seri, I'll turn the virtual floor over to you. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk and for that kind introduction. I'm absolutely thrilled to be introducing the audience to a field in which I've been working for over 20 years now. You know, human fascination with flight is thought to predate recorded history. Once it was the realm of hobbyists and eccentrics, 
and early aerospace medicine was most likely related to managing injuries. Then in 1903, we saw the Wright brothers' first flight, and thereafter, there was an exponential growth in aviation to the point it became part of everyday life. In 1909, the first controlled powered flight in Canada was made by University of Toronto graduate Douglas McCurdy. Canadian innovation in aviation began to solve problems at home and abroad. Note the skis there on the Beaver plane. Canada's north uh, cannot accommodate unconventional or cannot accommodate, sorry, conventional runways. Our northern geography poses challenges to this day. Canada is a vast country. We have a small population and we have a harsh environment. And as a result, we have a spirit of innovation. And if necessity is the mother of invention, then our own Frederick Banting is widely considered the father of aviation medicine in Canada. Captain in the Royal Canadian Army Corps in World War I, Banting was persuaded prior to World War II that aircraft at the time exceeded the physical capacity of flight crew. Fighter pilots were blacking out during high-speed turns, or pulling G as we say, and Banting became the first chair of the Committee on Aviation Medical Research. Initially, Banting's team worked out of the University of Toronto, but it became rapidly apparent that a more private facility was needed to do classified research. Federal government grant enabled the purchase of the Eglinton Hunt Club near downtown Toronto in 1939, and the site is still recognizable near Marshall McLuhan Secondary School there on the bottom picture. Known as the number one clinical investigation unit, or CIU, then later the RCF Institute of Aviation Medicine, it was a top secret facility disguised as an air crew evaluation unit. In 1952, a new research lab was built in Downsview, which still exists today. And I'm currently a consultant there at CFEME, co-located with DRDC at Shepherd and Allen near the Shepherd West subway stop. Watch for that mounted aircraft next time you drive by. A human centrifuge was constructed at the clinical investigation unit. It was designed by Banting's collaborator, Dr. Wilbur Franks who was doing cancer research at U of T at the time. And although it was a top secret project, there were clues of its existence. Powered by a streetcar motor, it shared the city's electrical lines. And every time it was fired up, it said that nearby streetcars would grind to a halt. The centrifuge was used to develop the anti-G suit called the Frank's flying suit. And research at the unit made many other important contributions to the advancement of aerospace medicine. The site is still the only operational human-rated centrifuge in Canada. Canada continued to be involved in aerospace medicine through the Gemini and Apollo eras. Canadian flight surgeon Dr. Bill Carpentier was directly involved with the Apollo 11 crew recovery and stayed with them in quarantine after their return to Earth. For those medical folks online, we're so excited to have Bill as our inaugural speaker at Aerospace Medicine Rounds coming soon in January, so please join us for that. Even before him, even in the Gemini missions, was Owen Coombs, a U of T grad and RCAF flight surgeon. That's a term that used originally for military physicians involved with aviation has since expanded to include civil aerospace medicine physicians working with space missions. Coombs and Carpentier learned a great deal about survival in space and its associated hazards including decompression sickness, a risk that still exists for divers and astronauts alike. My dear colleague, Major Ken Hedges is a retired assistant professor at the Department of Family Medicine at the U of T and first honorary colonel of the Royal Canadian Medical Service at CF Health Services Training Center in Borden. He was a member of the British Transarctic Expedition pictured here rescuing his dog on Arctic ice. Four men and their pack of 40 sled dogs took 476 days to traverse almost 6,000 kilometers and complete the first surface crossing of the long axis of the Arctic Ocean. This expedition occurred only weeks before the July 1969 moon landing. Like the moon landing, it highlighted the realities of survival in a harsh environment and demonstrated how the Canadian North is much like space. 
It also taught us about the impact of isolation on mental health, highlighted again through the recent pandemic. Isolation is one of the significant hazards expected in future long duration space missions. Still, it took a small group of dedicated individuals working with the Royal College until 2012 to finalize the recognition of aerospace medicine as a discipline in Canada. Aerospace medicine is an area of medical competence focused on the health and safety of aircrew members in the flying public, and the scope of practice includes specialized knowledge related to human health, safety, and performance in three environments, civil or commercial aviation, military aviation, and space. Unlike practitioners of many medical specialties where the focus is on assessing, diagnosing, and treating ill individuals in what we'll call a normal environment, Specialists in fields such as occupational and aerospace medicine have expertise in keeping people well in hazardous environments or caring for and transporting people to and from these environments. The hazards and risks vary between the environments and also with the role of the individual. Risk tolerance for the captain who's controlling the aircraft is stricter than for a passenger and that makes sense. Example of some of the hazards include hypoxia, gravitational forces, barometric pressure changes jet lag radiation. And in addition to the environmental hazards, we may create some hazards for ourselves. This slide demonstrates the accumulation of orbital debris around the Earth over a period of 50 years. Orbital debris may increase the risk of collision with vehicles passing through it with catastrophic consequences. Did anyone see the movie Gravity by any chance? Let's talk briefly about each of the three aviation sectors. First, the civil aviation sector. You know every doctor knows a passenger, and therefore shouldn't every physician have some basic knowledge of the aircraft environment? This is not currently a topic of medical school teaching. There are many Canadian aviation innovations in civil aviation, Leading the way to enable diabetics with insulin pumps to fly as pilots is one of those, as similarly in mental health, enabling safe flight with certain medical, mental, sorry, with certain um, mental health medications. Predicting infectious disease spread and control, uh, for example, U of T's own Cameron Khan and his Blue Dot initiative, and the translation of concepts in aviation team training and communication through to patient safety. In 1965, it was a Canadian who proposed the idea of making medical risk analogous to mechanical risk from which the 1% rule is derived. And this is an evidence-based way of assessing whether the risk of certain medical conditions are low enough to prevent catastrophe and allow a pilot to thereby continue flying. Other Canadian innovations in military flight medicine include fatigue risk management and circadian shifting, medical components of crash investigation and air evacuation, integration of virtual reality, such as tanker refueling and see-through heads-up displays and return to flight post-COVID. Now let's talk for a moment about space medicine. Terrestrial sites that resemble the geological, environmental, or biological conditions of a celestial body are called analogs. These environments may also be analogous to space for other reasons, such as isolation or confinement, having a requirement for self-sufficiency, having communication delays. Such sites are used to do research and test prototypes for space medicine and other disciplines. The Canadian North is an ideal analog in many ways. Why is this important for us on Earth? Well, if we can solve the problems in one environment, we can translate it for use in the other. Innovations developed in or for space often have terrestrial benefits. And similarly, terrestrial health and health technology innovations enable health and survival in space. For example, and one that I think most Canadians will be familiar with is that of Canadian robotics. Developed for space station programs has inspired health-related spin-off technologies that improve the quality of life on Earth. For example, the world's first robot capable of performing surgery inside MRI machines. As we go faster, higher, and further, what this means is different and often greater risk. 
Recently on the news, we've watched numerous firsts in space, and we're essentially resetting that starting point of exponential growth in many areas, in my opinion. Exponential growth and accessibility in the sense that now space is not just for professional astronauts anymore. And this should help us increase our understanding of how humans adapt in space, might address some issues of gender differences because we have more numbers of people flying. Exponential growth in destinations with multiple space stations under construction. We have a new place of employment and we may have new medical care requirements, therefore. Exponential growth in the ways to get there with multiple vehicles, which we've watched in the news most recently. Exponential growth in the duration that we stay. As we extend our time and space, we gain an understanding of our own capability to adapt and also learn of unanticipated emerging problems. And exponential growth in level of autonomy. Self-driving vehicles, for example, if you watch the launch of Blue Origin, we must trust our artificial intelligence. I'm currently working with a team on this issue. But while access to space is increasing, challenges remain in the northern unserviced communities that continue to struggle with limited access to things like healthcare. And furthermore, as the world at home continues to get smaller with suborbital passenger flights on the horizon, both people and diseases travel faster. When more people have more reasons to go more places and with more ways to get there, and at home we have capability but unmet needs, especially in the Canadian North, we will require experts to develop medical models that incorporate concepts such as just-in-time training, simulation and training, AI integration for monitoring, decision support tools for diagnosis. We need to develop a cadre of highly trained aerospace medicine specialists prepared to participate in education, research, and interdisciplinary collaboration. The Advisory Council on Deep Space Health has envisioned a new role for Canada in deep space healthcare that reinforces this conclusion. And a new U of T fellowship would enable participation in Canada's next big thing. An ancient Chinese philosopher once said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step and the times are clearly changing. We are at a new time zero for exponential growth and we should position ourselves to imagine, define and participate in the future. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Captain Picard. I hope you found that interesting. I'll stop my sharing now. Yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seri. Uh, it was very fascinating. I was getting flashbacks, especially with the history to watching the moon landing on my fuzzy black and white TV as a child and uh, that stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I lived in Northern Ontario where the uh, astronauts used to come and train in Sudbury because it looked like the moon before they learned how to plant grass uh, on the tail, the, the fillings uh, from the, the mine. So uh, brought back lots of good memories. So we have a lot of audience questions, obviously an area where people are quite fascinated, as you said at the outset, with space flight, with uh, medicine in space. So I'm going to jump right into them. I think the number one question, I've tried to group them into uh, different uh, categories. I think the number one question seems to be coming from students, and they all want to know, how can I do aerospace medicine? So I thought the way we could tackle this is you could talk a bit about how did you get into this field? Uh, I, I don't imagine you grew up a, as a girl saying I want to be in aerospace medicine, but uh, how did you get there? You're absolutely right, Andre. I did not grow up thinking I want to go there. And in fact, I would say I had a journey of lifelong learning to get me where I am today. I often think about it like a Venn diagram or leaves overlapping and eventually coming to the center, a meandering path of discovery, so to speak. I, uh, I started actually in psychology uh, and I went from there to medicine. And initially in medicine, I was quite interested in imaging, which of course, psychology and imaging are both relevant for aerospace medicine, but uh, I've family, my husband's family was familiar with military medicine. His dad was a general um, and he was interested in diving and I learned about occupational medicine from my mom. So I tied all that together, to be honest. I started training with the uh, Canadian forces uh, as a civilian learning about diving medicine. And that's really the nidus where all of those things kind of came together. 
because at that time there was research underway at CFEME and DRDC where I work now, uh, trying to mitigate risk of spacewalking. And the interesting thing is I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I think that's the way it is for a lot of students and for a lot of women. Uh, you just don't know what you don't know and you don't think of it until it's there and in front of you. So that was my journey. Yeah, so a lot of serendipity there. Today, it's a bit different. Uh, you mentioned in your talk, there's actually a fellowship for aerospace medicine now. Why, why would you encourage a, a younger person to look at something like that? I think it's an exciting way to uh, tie a lot of disciplines together. And I think it's an exciting way to be a part of what I think will be, as I said in my talk, uh, the start of exponential growth. In the last, uh, I would say, one or two years, we've probably seen more launches of different new vehicles than we have seen in decades before that. And I think the train is at the station, so to speak. I think that uh, things, are, things are starting. And I also think, as we think about how to um, go forward in a way that solves both terrestrial and space problems, I think there will be opportunity for interdisciplinary learning. And so from that, I think it's safe to say students from a wide variety of disciplines could find themselves feeling comfortable in the area. Uh, but we're getting an audience question with a little bit of little bit of skepticism saying, but are there jobs? Uh, is there a space industry in Canada? Will we all have to just go to the US? So is the industry there? Are the jobs there for people who are, are fascinated by this field? So that's an interesting question. And to be honest, it was one I think I probably asked myself and I probably asked my own students 20 years ago in terms of where are we going with this? And I, I think now, to be honest, the timing is different. Things are the situation in the world and the situation in Canada it is different. I think that uh, as we head towards our new partnership with Lunar Gateway and Canada's involvement with Lunar Gateway, uh, I think that the conception of a new program is aligned with advisory council recommendations in the sense that if we are at the cusp of exponential growth, does an individual who has expertise in aerospace medicine need specifically to practice as a clinician in that field? Or does the experience in that field enable them to practice in another area of specialty, but extend their uh, tentacles, so to speak, in education and research to be part of a bigger picture of Canada's eventual role in space. Yeah, so I guess the message there is you don't just have to work for the space agency or the Canadian Armed Forces. There's going to yes. be all kinds of things. There's going to be tourist buses to, to Mars or whatever someday. I agree. And I also think, too, that if a student, space is inherently interdisciplinary. And if a student or other clinician already with a specialty has an interest or experience or research in the Canadian North, in underserviced populations, in technology, by making technology smaller, lighter, more user friendly, in genetics, nutrition, the microbiome, radiation or mental health, in, even in education, in simulation-based team training, virtual reality, all of those things are components of aerospace medicine and understanding and being, having the capacity to make those links and tie those things together in a way uh, really enables an individual with that expertise to contribute significantly to Canada's cadre of experienced um, individuals and leaders in the field. Great. Now, a couple of people are interested. They're asking, you know, have you ever been to space? Do you ever plan to go to space? Either? Or do you just study it or do you want to go there too? What an interesting question. And I can remember years ago, I was once asked the question saying, do you want to be an astronaut or do you want to be a flight surgeon? Because you can't be both. And I think at that time, perhaps I felt my talents were needed on the ground and I embarked on becoming an expert on the ground. Keep in mind at that time, there weren't too many people who had been uh, astronauts and flight surgeons together. Now there is experience with that and there are many of those. And now the opportunity is greater for people who 
you know, are not professional astronauts to hitch a ride. Uh, although you do need to have, you need, you need to have a bit of independent wealth at this point. So I hope over the course of the next few years, the cost of those flights will come down to make it even more accessible. But if uh, William Shatner can go at age 90, I guess pretty well anybody can go to space in theory if they have the money. Yes, and it's interesting too, because the range too, I think uh, the, the youngest individual has also flown. I think the age was 18, if I'm not mistaken. So the age range of people and the demographics. And uh, I think I'm safe to say that the European Space Agency is actually in their, their, uh, their call for astronauts is actually paying attention now to um, individuals with disabilities and, and how individuals of a wide uh, variety uh, of backgrounds and health conditions can and can't fly. And that's been an area of research that I think would tie back to perhaps one of the other questions that you asked earlier in terms of jobs and expertise, which is uh, there is going to be a lot of new learning that has to happen to help us understand how regular folks can fly. They're not professional astronauts. Professional astronauts are highly screened, highly chosen, highly trained. But, but what about somebody that wants to fly that's had a heart attack or has diabetes? Is that okay? There's a lot of research to be done to understand if they can tolerate it, what they can tolerate it, what we need to do to make it safe for them. Now, this, this leads into there's a lot of health related questions coming from the audience uh, about, you know, mostly how prolonged space flight can affect physiology. So I'm going to go through some of these categories that have come up individually. But as you mentioned, this is all important as we democratize space, as anybody can go, uh, the health impacts matter more. We have to be know more about this because I, I know, I, I know uh, I've met some astronauts are all super athletes, et cetera, that not like the rest of us. So let me start with the, the one that people all ask. Uh, it's about mental health. So if we go off into space and we fly to Mars for, I don't know how long that would take, but are we all going to go crazy? So I guess that's the big first question people want to know is the impact on mental health from space flight. Yeah, so that's very interesting. One of the things that space flight does is put you in a confined space with a fixed number of people far from your family. Uh, there are issues related to privacy, obviously, and separation. And there may be issues related to fear or the acceptance of risk and danger. Uh, but are those specifically space related or are those actually common earthbound issues. I think one thing the pandemic has highlighted for us is that some of these concerns related to mental health are actually partly earthbound conditions. So how can we manage these? Um, and so are we going to go crazy? Well, I, I hope not, but there are things we can do to enhance uh, well-being. And those things partly include, uh, for example, something called expeditionary behavior, uh, that's a type of behavior where individuals are, are very active in um, taking care of themselves, in pitching in, so to speak. Um, and there's a, there's a saying, when the going get tough, the tough, and we substitute get going to be act like a cow, which is just kind of stand there, don't go crazy, stay calm, you know, the stay calm and carry on kind of thing. Um, so there's that expeditionary behavior, which can be trained. It can, we can have realistic simulation as well before we embark on a very long mission. That helps with both the individual and also the team dynamic, because you want to put together a team that's going to work functionally in a long, long trip. Um, and so there are sort of these uh, basic things, though, that we've learned as a, as a global community in the last few years the importance and meaningfulness of, of leisure and of having good social connections, um, of having meaningful work, those things are all important in sustaining mental health. And then there are other few other things that maybe people don't think about in terms of how well you can control it, which is the impact of our sleep schedules and changing the artificial lighting to have less blue and more red at certain times to, to make the, the sleep-wake cycle be more reasonable and ensure we have good sleep. But there is also, I mean, 
When we talk about mental health, and I'll just wrap it up with one last comment on this question, which is we often assume that it's going to be horror and we're all going to go crazy. But interestingly, there is another com uh, concept called salutogenesis in which there's some thought about the fact that it might actually be good for health in the sense that it's a, a bonding with shared experiences of a fixed duration in time in which people are participating in a project that they feel is very high valuable and has substantial reward. So I'll leave it at that. That's some trade-offs there. So the other yeah. one, lots of interest in musculoskeletal, are we all gonna lose our muscle mass and have brittle bones? I know this is studied a lot in astronauts, but what about with ordinary people? Right, so in astronauts that is studied for sure. And in fact, those are some of the terrestrial benefits of studying astronauts in space is better understanding uh, conditions like a muscular dystrophy and osteoporosis and what we learned from having a lack of weight bearing exercise and ability. Um, and so are we all gonna lose our bones? Well, the answer is left unchecked, potentially so, but what we try to do is implement things called countermeasures. We know that there's roughly one or 2% per month, I think is the statistic, um, loss in bone over the course of a long duration mission. What can we do to prevent that on the space station? Uh, there are a variety of ways. Uh, one of them is a treadmill. The other is an exercise bike. The other is a resistive exercise trainer. And, and then there's also medications as well, like um, combination of those things and what combination works best and for how long is something that still, uh, work is still underway. But uh, that's a key thing is the concept of countermeasures. How do we mitigate known risks to make them uh, palatable enough that someone would be willing to undertake such a lengthy mission. And then there are questions on women's health. Uh, you know, Canada has famous women astronauts, Roberta Bondar, Julie Payette, but a very tiny minority of astronauts have actually been women. So do we know about uh, the impact on fertility, menstrual cycles, for example? Will that change in space? Well, we know uh, some about women, but one thing I could say is, uh, you know, for those who know studies and research, when we have of the of the world's astronaut, not just Canada's, but of the as flown astronauts, roughly 89% of the astronauts have been men up until this point, only 11 or so percent have have been women. And so we're in the process of gathering data and we do we do know uh, some things about women's health. Uh, for example, women are more susceptible to things like orthostatic intolerance. Uh, women are more susceptible to urinary tract infections to some extent. Uh, and women have different immune responses. Um, the type of kidney stones that happen in space are different between men and women, or so it seems with these small numbers of, of studies, well, of people that we have access to study. Um, in terms of menstrual cycles, to be honest, in order to facilitate ease in space, many women will um, voluntarily opt to suppress the menstrual cycle. Although what we know so far is that if, it's let, if you don't suppress it, menstrual cycles are normal. In other words, they're not, you don't preserve blood, you still have a normal menstrual cycle. But as I mentioned, many will chemically um, choose not to um, continue. And I think to some extent, the question has been whether or not suppression of a menstrual cycle for that period of time uh, without an interval uh, release is a challenge. Um, and we have uh, some long duration flyers, but not a lot of experience as far as a mission to Mars would be. Uh, but so far, uh, the results look reassuring that suppression would not cause long-term problem. And of course, you probably know this from uh, doing public talks, but a lot of interest in toileting and gut health. Uh, you know, how, to, how are we all going to pee in space? And uh, is it going to affect uh, the way we eat? Uh, uh, 
processed food, especially if we have like a reading out of tubes, I don't know how it'll work, but that, that gut health right. stuff, there's a lot of interest in. Yeah, so when you think about um, gut health, it's interesting that you say that because there are some studies underway now um, about uh, the microbiome and how the microbiome changes in space and whether or not there is a particular uh, microbiome footprint or fingerprint, I guess, uh, that it becomes space specific. Um, and in fact, many people have widely varied microbiomes. Uh, one thing for sure is that, well, the food for the most part is packaged unless you can get a resupply mission. And so on the space station, there is access to that. I remember a story told to me once, and if he's watching, he'll remember, because uh, he was himself a flyer on, uh, on a longer duration mission, and they were expecting a, a they had a resupply mission and it had some sushi and they were very excited. The team had the sushi because it was fresh and it turned out that they had actually eaten the meal specifically prepared for the next launching astronaut who did not have any sushi as a result. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I digress uh, a little bit on longer duration missions. That's going to be more of a challenge. And so uh, one of the areas of research underway now is whether or not one can grow one's own food on a long duration mission. And can you eat lettuce? And I believe there is some experience that it is possible to grow green vegetables and then pick them and eat them in space. Yeah, I know Matt Damon did that on Mars, so I guess the rest of us could do that too. So uh, if we saw that yes. movie, The Martian. Uh, That's of course, uh, potatoes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've bombarded you with all kinds of general questions, but I want to give you a chance to talk about your research as well. So you do research on white matter hyperintensitivity. Uh, could you talk about that? I know it has some implications for things like Alzheimer's. Talk a bit about that and uh, an example of aerospace medicine in action. Sure. So. Um... My research on white matter hyperintensities, those are small white uh, dots on MRI imaging, which is a me mechanism of imaging the brain. Um, they've been around for a while and they've been long uh, known to be associated with aging and with um, processes of aging related to dementia and Alzheimer's. And um, they were noticed in uh, some United States Air Force pilots who fly the U-2, which is a plane that goes quite high in altitude. And so there was a, a NATO working group set up to understand what's happening in these pilots who are younger. Why would these younger guys have this thing, which normally would be associated with an aging process? Are they aging more quickly? Is something happening with the environment? And so my research is the Canadian contribution to that NATO working group where I'm looking specifically at fighter pilots. Fighter pilots are an interesting cohort. They have multiple exposures. They, the, they, uh, they can, depending on the aircraft they uh, fly, have exposure to higher altitude. They also have exposure to G and sometimes hypoxia. And so I'm working with a team uh, combined myself with some of our defense research and development folks who are looking at the impact of uh, military trades that are non-aviation trades like breachers and snipers, as well as Dr. Sandra Black at the center, the Sandra Black Center named after her for uh, brain resilience and recovery at Sunnybrook. And together we're looking at what's happening in this younger cohort to find out whether or not there's more white matter than we thought there ever was in younger people. We are looking at biomarkers for inflammation, uh, to determine whether or not these white matter things may come and go. And, and if they do, that will hopefully give us a better understanding of what some of the causes might be. Our ultimate goal is to understand them well enough to do something that could prevent them if there's anything that we could do to prevent them. So and that's one area. Practically, so, practically, does this mean that space travel may age us uh, prematurely? Well, it may mean that we will uh, accumulate some of these white matter hyperintensities, but the challenge is knowing what that actually means. Because in almost all of our fighter pilots, we have found them, but not a single one of them seems to have any performance effect. 
So it doesn't seem to affect their ability. It's not as though we have to say you're grounded, you can't fly anymore. In fact, we do neurocognitive testing on them and they all do very, very well. So we don't know the meaning of that. I think one thing that we don't know as we uh, go on longer duration missions and relates to brain and aging is whether or not having those kind of things in your brain will be affected by exposure to radiation, which in long duration missions, that is something one cannot avoid. So there's more research to be done, but it's, it's early days to make comments on that yet. So lots of audience interest in Mars. People want to know, do you think physiologically, can we go to Mars? Can humans do that? Well, in terms of Okay, so let's start with the engineering process. I'm pretty sure the engineers could get us there. So the question is, can the human inside the tank survive that long? We've had longer and longer um, displays of successful missions on the space station uh, over a year. Have we had one as long as three years? No. So it would be the longest mission, although we are about to start our new, uh, the new concept of the Lunar Gateway, which may enable uh, missions that will go from lunar orbit down to the surface. So we may have some proof of concept of the ability to have a back and forth operation or have a surface-based operation. Um, but aside from that, are there, any, are there any showstoppers to prevent us from getting to Mars? Well, there are some risks we're going to have to accept. I think uh, our inability to know and uh, shield or prevent the effects of uh, radiation will be one. I think from a, a countermeasures perspective, there are a lot of risks we can mitigate, uh, either with uh, medications. The big challenge might be whether or not there's uh, some disaster that's unexpected we like to spend a lot of time predicting things and preventing what we think we can predict. And so that may be a bigger challenge as well. Something completely unexpected happens. How do we manage that? And do you think well, we have to, like in almost every space movie, put people to sleep in some kind of coma and then wake them up when they arrive? I'm doubtful of that. Although I will say that I'm aware there is some research actually looking at the possibility of a concept related to hibernation and whether or not I'm, I wouldn't say it's the exact same process as that, but I don't think that's uh, for a mission of that duration. I think more intent on those uh, missions to Mars, which would be roughly uh, three years probably in duration by the time all is said and done, um, you know, are we able to stay together as a team cohesive? The, the, the mission itself is a, a way out. There's a time there on the surface and then a way back. So it would really be sort of three components. It wouldn't be just one entire thing for three years. There's three individual components to it. So if we can make it through the first one, go to the second stage, make it to the third stage, uh, while remaining healthy and cohesive as a team. Uh, I, I actually think we're closer than um, maybe we would care to believe. But I also remember when I was uh, talking to my kids' schools, when about 10 years ago, I would talk to the kids' schools and say, you know, the future is here. There's this thing called a self-driving car. And they would look and go, what's that? There's this thing called a self-driving vacuum and it's the Roomba and everybody has one now. So the future is upon us. You can, uh, you can know about the future and it's not so sci-fi. So speaking of the future, we're almost out of time, but uh, let's take the last question to look forward. What, for all the students in the audience, what's aerospace medicine gonna look like in 10 years? What, what excites you? What's the science fiction that's gonna be real then? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I got asked that question. I'm thinking back in 2002 saying, can you predict the future? And even at that point, I would think, hmm, what, did, what, was, what were things like 10 years ago? And could I have anticipated the uh, cell phones and the Netflix and the tap and pay? It's hard to predict the future beyond 
a couple of years, I would say. But I think one thing that is for sure is that kids that are born today will not know a time when non-professional astronauts didn't go to space. There's multiple vehicles, there's going to be space stations and people will be able to go to them as though they are a hotel. So space travel will become, in my, in my presentation, I showed that exponential growth from when it went from the Wright brothers to part of daily life. And I anticipate that there will be uh, more and more movement towards it being a realistic part of daily life that isn't sci-fi anymore. Great. That's a wonderful way to end. I think you're telling us that we're all going to boldly go where no man or woman has gone before, as uh, some captain of an enterprise told us many times years ago. So thank you, uh, Dr. Joan Seri. Fascinating insight, a lot of interest from the audience. So thank you for being there today. Perfect. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed the chat and uh, I will welcome anyone that's interested in reaching out and uh, joining our bigger network. And I'll just remind people that there's a, a brief survey to complete. There's a link in the chat or a QR code that you can screen from the screen and uh, give us your feedback so we can help prepare future Temerty Talks. And thank you again to the audience for being there.